Now with the practice out of the way, let's consider more realistic and relevant situations. And uh, I think this is the situation that um, that um, that I was hoping you will see that leads naturally to Gauss's law. Um, now, this one, uh, you know, let me go, let me go through that. I think we got this far, spent a fair amount of time getting this far. I think uh, let me just. Uh, follow this instruction word for word because it's quite easy to follow in the first place. Um, it's a de describing a detailed mathematical calculation and I will tell you those are some of the easiest things you can do in, a, in classes like this one. When detailed mathematical calculations where you all you have to do is basically follow step by step and do those things that's the um, that is the easiest thing. And uh, what's harder are the tasks that require creativity because <laughs> that's, I, I hope you saw that with your lab report that um, that's where um, the choice means that uh, you need to make a judgment calls. You, ha you have to frankly know more to, do, to answer questions like those than if you are answering where um, questions where there's no real choice on your part. All you have to do is follow step by step. That's the easy thing. Those are the, yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the easy thing. So let me do the easy task here. It says consider a point, um, positive point charge. Uh, what is the net flux out of a sphere of radius R with a charge Q at the center? All right, let me draw that. So I have charge Q. And I'm going to draw my sphere so that the Q is at the center of that sphere. Let me draw my sphere of radius R uh, with the charge at the center. So I'm going to draw the kind of the side view of the sphere. And because it's a three dimensional object, I have to kind of add other indicators to have you imagine that it's a sphere surrounding the charge. And it says that choose the normal vector so that every point on the sphere the normal vector points outward. That's the convention that I was referring to. Uh, with the closed surfaces, the convention for the, uh, so with the you know, normal vector, you only have two choices. Is it one way or the other way? Those are your two choices. And when you have an open surface, you have a free choice. You can go with either. When you have a closed surface, then the convention is that the outward pointing normal vectors are the positive normal vectors. That's the convention. So n points outward, and that direction will actually turn out to be fairly useful because um, as you look at it, so you already know what the electric field of a point charge looks like from Gauss's law, Gauss's law, Coulomb's law, and um, those radially outgoing directions, they happen to match those radially outward pointing normal vectors. So that'll actually make my dot product super easy. So let me write down the full expression for electric flux and point out the simplifications. The electric flux here is integral of the E dot dA over the surface of the sphere. Um, which means, uh, let me handle two parts separately, the magnitudes and the directions. So, um, so the magnitudes will be the magnitude of the electric field as a function of distance and the, the area element, dA, that's something that I'm going to have to um, work out. So that's one. And because I have the dot product here, I need to mine the directions. And the, dot pro the directions will be the r hat vector, the radially outgoing r hat vector dot product with the n hat vector. And what, you will, what I was pointing out was that at every point on the sphere, these two vectors are actually in the same direction. So this product that I was separating out, that's just one. <laughs> because it's so simple, I want you to make sure to highlight it and uh, make sure you don't miss it. Because if it was some value other than one, then there's no chance you would have missed it. But because it's so simple, it is easy to miss it. And for the circumstances where you can't miss it, I want to highlight it. So directions are simple. Now, all I have to deal with is this um, magnitudes. 
And there's actually additional simplification here, which is the fact that we are doing the area integral over the points on the sphere. And what's useful here is that every point on the sphere is at distance r. And you know from Gauss's law that the electric field of a point charge is um, Coulomb constant times the, the point charge Q divided by R squared, which means on the sphere, this uh, distance R is not changing. So over the, 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 the surface that you're integrating, this uh, electric field here, it's actually constant. So I don't, there's no, um, I can pull it out of the integral. That's the simple thing to do. So let me do that. I can pull that out of the integral. And then I have this integral of the area element over a sphere. And I guess I could actually write down the area element and actually do the integral. You, you know, I can do that and get the correct answer. Or I can do the easy thing and recognize that what this is giving me is a surface area of sphere. So I happen to have that memorized, like every good physicist, or pi r squared. So I'm just going to plug that in. So here the flux, the total flux ends up being the value of the electric field. Oh, that's that there. Let me write that down. Uh, K e, the Coulomb constant times the charge divided by, and I'm going to be careful to put in the actual value of R, which is capital R, capital R squared. That's the electric field times the area, 4 pi R squared. Oh, R's cancel. Huh. So um, it ends up giving me 4 pi times KEQ. And um, later on, I hope you recognize that uh, this is actually what would have been given by Gauss's law. We just did it the long way and did a calculation using Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law and Gauss's law are equivalent to each other, so they both should give the same result. So, all right, that's the easy calculation. <laughs> Show your work with the explicit calculation. Make sure to cancel out anything that cancels out. Show the cancellation, did all that. Um, let's see what's next. Um, consider the following change to the setup. If the sphere has been placed so that the charge is not at the center, but r over 2 away from the center, could you do a calculation similar to Q12? I mean, I can. Um, it won't be similar. <laughs> I think that's what the bonus point is getting at. Um, so, you know, I can in the sense that, all right, I can set this up. I can write this out. I can do the DA. Now, this won't simplify this way because if the charge is, because if the charge is over here, then now the radial direction away, it's not going to necessarily be the same direction as n hat, like over here, the r hat goes that way, and it goes that way. So it won't simplify nicely this way, all right? <laughs> and I won't be able to pull out the electric field because the electric field magnitude here will be stronger and versus electric field magnitude here, which will be weaker. And now, if you know Gauss's law, uh, <laughs> you know that the result here that this is equal to that, it actually does not, that result itself does not depend on symmetry. Gauss's law gives you that as a matter of statement. So that's one way in which you could do, do this uh, flux calculation. You repeal, appeal to Gauss's law, which um, gives you the flux directly. That's one way. And in a face-to-face -face lab session, what I would hope that this activity would lead to is that you can actually intuitively guess what the Gauss's law gives you. It's this. In the previous exercise, you saw how flux, um, you know, the flow of the electric fields um, through a surface, it kind of depended on how the the electric fields appear to go through a surface. So there's a way to estimate or calculate flux 
by counting how many electric field lines go through a surface. Now, you know, it's a qualitative thing. It's a proportionality thing. So, you know, here I see eight lines going through and you can't say my flux is eight lines <laughs> to tell me exactly what the quantity is. But what I can tell you is that these eight lines going through that corresponds to this amount of flux here. And this is what I want you to consider. When I, uh, let me do it this way. Uh, when I move this charge so that it is over here, imagine moving all the electric field lines and again counting how many electric field lines go through the sur uh, surface of the sphere. Let me actually do that. Uh, let me draw a charge here, draw a sphere around it, and let me draw the same number of uh, electric field lines as I have done before. And when I draw those the same number of electric field lines as before, you will quickly see that, oh yeah, the same eight lines have to go through the surface of the sphere at some point. Now, for some of them, they now go through earlier, by which I mean, you know, not actually time. I'm trying to follow the flow analogy. The, they uh, cross the surface at a closer distance. So the electric field strength would be greater there. So at some places they happen, quote unquote, later, by which I mean farther distance. So the field magnitude is weaker there. But one thing that won't change as you move this charge around within the sphere is that all these eight lines have to escape the sphere at some point. So in terms of counting number of electric field lines, it'll be the same. So from this graphical representation you see here, you can, with some intuition around how electric field lines are related to flux, you can see that as you move this charge, the total electric flux hasn't changed and frankly cannot change for, um, <laughs> cannot change for geometric reasons. Uh, I'll put a bit of a qualifier there um, in a bit. But I think as you're, I hope, I'm hoping as you're considering this intuitive picture that you get the intuitive feel that as long as this charge is, is inside the sphere, that this result that we calculated for a highly symmetric setup, it remains to be true for a situation that's not very symmetric at all. And this is the intuition that I'm hoping will lead to your intuition for Gauss's law, that, that the Gauss's law is true. Now, there is a, um, oh, I guess I'm, I'm <laughs> jumping to epilogue there. Um, should I do question 14? Uh, oh, you know, what? let me do question 14. I think I can do, uh, Question 14, um, I think I can do question 14 exactly as stated and a slightly modified version. And um, I think I can use that to continue to build this intuition for the connection between electric field lines and flux and how that relates to Gauss's law. So let me draw this picture. The picture here is, I have a charge plus Q and a sphere around it. That's the sphere through which I'm gonna calculate, I'm gonna calculate a flux. And I can imagine placing a negative charge at two different places. The first is where question 14 tells me to, way out here, minus Q. Now, as you imagine drawing the electric field lines, I want you to think about how many electric field lines still go through the surface. If uh, I'm still drawing eight for one charge, if uh, all these eight lines still have to go through the surface at some point. And I hope uh, you think through it for a bit and then realize, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> it relates to one of the rules about drawing electric field lines. One of the rules was that these electric field lines, they begin and end on, they begin on positive charge 
an endonegative charge. So these eight lines, they begin on the positive charge. And until they encounter this negative charge, they can't end. So uh, I can choose to end the three of these lines on the negative charge, and actually two more. These two can end on the negative charge. But in order to land on this negative charge, they all have to go through the surface at some point, which means this negative charge being present there, it didn't change any of the flux through this surface because negative charge being out here, it didn't change the fact that all these eight electric field lines have to go through the surface to get to that. Now, when the negative charge, so this is the question that the question 14 didn't ask, but I'm gonna ask anyway. When the negative charge is inside a sphere, that changes this picture. So when I have, uh, yeah, let me just redraw this entirely. So when I have positive charge here, and the negative charge here, then following the same field line drawing rules, this is what you have. Eight lines are starting from here. And all those eight lines either going out to infinity, like this one, it'll just go out to infinity, or um, landing on the negative charge. It begin on the positive charge and ends on the negative charge. And as you consider these field lines, I hope you see that the net, uh, net electric flux through the sphere will be zero. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't electric field lines going through the surface. It's just that when you finish counting them, all the ones that go out and all the ones that come in, uh, ones that go out are counting as positive, ones that come in are counting as negative, and they have to add up to zero. And uh, any line that goes out here has a part that comes back in, or any line that's exiting here from the positive charge, there's a corresponding part that enters and ends on the negative charge. So when you finish counting all those crossing points, they add up to zero. So, and you can see, um, I hope you are beginning to see intuitively how that matches with what Gauss's law says. Gauss's law only considers the net charge with the, inside the volume that you are considering. Here, the net charge is zero, and that matches with the net negative, net, um, net zero flux for this particular situation. And all of this is leading up to the intuition for Gauss's law. And what I want to say and end with is what Gauss's law really says, and, um, and which of the electric field line drawing rules uh, are on expression of Gauss's law. So, yeah, the questions are better <laughs> leading you to Gauss's law on your own. Gauss's law, which says this, it's quite intuitively true. And it, it, it's saying, this is the thing it's saying, that electric charges are sources of electric field lines. The rule that we are trying to obey uh, from above is this rule here, which is that electric field lines, they originate on positive charges. So positive charges are sources of electric field lines, or they terminate on negative charges, or the negative charges are sinks of electric field lines. This is the field line version of Gauss's law. As long as this is true when you're drawing field lines, Gauss's law is true. And as long as Gauss's law is true, we must have this as one of our rules for drawing electric field lines. And I think what's useful to consider are uh, what I like to call counterexamples. And this rule and Gauss's law and all of that is very intimately tied to something called, inf uh, tied to the fact that um, the electric field, the Coulomb's law is, um, is an inverse square law that electric field magnitude is proportional to one over R squared. 
that's very closely tied to this. Now, there are physical laws where forces are not inverse square laws, um, a short range of forces like nuclear forces. So for those kind of forces, you don't have a version of Gauss's law. And you also don't have electric field line, field line drawing rule that's similar to this. The field line drawing rules that you see here are related to the fact that the, the electric force is an inverse square law force. It's a long range force. And uh, once a field line starts on a positive charge, that the only way that line can end is a negative charge. So within the constraint, um, which is a, the constraint coming from the property of the electricity itself, Gauss's law is intuitively true. You do need a constraint. It, this is not something that's just universally true always. It, this is a, a law that holds for electricity and gravity in some version. Uh, uh, the better way to handle gravity is general relativity. It's a geometric thing, but let not get there. So this is a property that holds for electric field. And it's a property that's associated with a long range force. So. So yeah, that's introduction to Gauss's law. It's a you know, quite lengthy introduction. Again, the original design of this activity was that I wouldn't be lecturing for two hours. You would be actually doing this activity and um, over the period of three hours of lab time that you will you would figure this out on your own. Um, I, sorry, I wish I knew a better way to do this online. Uh, since it might take me some years to figure that out for now. This semester I'm doing this as a replacement for that. Um, and yeah, and I think I hope as you are learning Gauss's law and its applications this week, uh, that's the uh, week six module items. That um, the, the this is the challenge with Gauss's law that it it is and it can seem very abstract. So people either, as you look at it, your eyes glaze over it, or you either underestimate it in terms of its importance um, and its uh, kind of complex ideas that are contained in it because it does look very simple. You either underestimate it or you uh, get overwhelmed by the abstractness of the statement. So, um, so what I'm doing here is to trying to bridge that gap. 